Okay, now for part two of, of chapter 44. Uh, first part, we talked more about the general uh, concepts and the assessment of our pediatric patient. Uh, now we'll, we'll touch on the uh, specific pediatric emergencies uh, that we may run into um, in the field. <laughs> so there's numerous respiratory problems, and, and I've mentioned this, that respiratory problems continue to be the number one major problem for our pediatric pi patient um, and if they're going to deteriorate, if they're going to have a uh, cardiac arrest, it's most likely from an, an unresolved respiratory issue. So they go into a respiratory distress, into a respiratory failure, and finally into a respiratory uh, arrest. So by quickly identifying that there's a respiratory issue and uh, restoring appropriate ventilation and oxygenation hopefully we can avoid from having to go down that road. Um, some of those <coughs> major problems that we uh, talk about in the pediatric population uh, are asthma. Now the asthma may be um, something that they outgrow, may be something that, uh, that they have for the rest of their life. Um, infectious respiratory illnesses such as croup and, and uh, epiglottitis and bronchitis and bronchiolitis um, cystic fibrosis, uh, which is a genetic issue, uh, which they actually have a lot of, uh, if you remember from the medical emergencies uh, chapter, uh, lots of uh, thick uh, secretions uh, that have primarily it, it shows up as a respiratory issue, uh, although it happens everywhere, also uh, greatly affects the gastrointestinal system, uh, but uh, obviously it, it takes its toll the quickest on the respiratory uh, system. Anaphylaxis could potentially be a large issue that we deal with as well. <clears throat> um, things that are maybe a little more prevalent uh, as a sign of a respiratory emergency in the pediatric population as opposed to the adult, um, grunting with expiration. When we have people who are grunting, particularly kids that are grunting upon expiration, it is their attempt to uh, really splint their own airways open. Uh, so they're kind of CPAPing themselves or peeping themselves uh, by grunting, uh, holding back a little back pressure. Uh, nasal flaring, uh, retractions above the clavicles and between the ribs can be very prominent as well as belly breathing. Now that belly breathing may also be called seesaw respiration, which if you now stop for a moment, look down at your own chest and take a good deep breath in, the whole system moved outward and upward. Your belly and your chest together probably moved in the same direction. With pediatrics and their seesaw respiration, it's very possible that they are going to have, when they suck in air, their chest will actually expand, but their stomach will, in, uh, will uh, contract inward, almost suck up into the chest cavity, if you will. Uh, and then when they exhale, their chest falls and their belly then pops back out. That's called seesaw respiration <clears throat> or belly breathing. Nasal flaring, they're simply trying to make their airways bigger uh, so they can get more air in quicker. Um, and then there's retractions. We have retractions as adults, particularly the COPD patient, but uh, the uh, retractions uh, between the ribs and above the clavicles are more prevalent in kids because there's less muscle mass there. So it's not as easy to see in the adult population. Uh, hi as hypoxia develops, pediatric patients become bradycardic. Um, and, and, and this is actually uh, true of, of most patients, but uh, in the adults uh, it, it tends to take a little bit longer to get there uh, to the point in which they give up and then they're um, uh, becoming bradycardic. <laughs> so here's some indications of pediatric respiratory distress. Um, abnormal sounds such as strider, crowing, wheezing, grunting, hoarseness. Well, apparently I have a pediatric respiratory disease. Um, snoring, coughing, gagging, or gasping. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I do. Uh, they're tachypnic or bradypnic, so fast or slow breathing. Tachycardic or bradycardic, fast or slow heart rates diminished air movement, so that could be seen as, as uh, 
minimal air movement, or I'm sorry, minimal chest rise and fall, um, or listening to their lung sounds and you just don't hear air moving. <coughs> Sats below 95, tripod positioning, suprasternal and intracostal retractions. So that's above their sternum, in between their collarbones and their um, trapezius muscle on the back, or between the ribs. Uh, use of accessory neck muscles to breathe, nasal flaring, head bobbing. Uh, that head bobbing comes when they're getting so tired and, and they're so exhausted that they're having a hard time um, keeping their own airway uh, open, holding their head up. Um, cyanosis or pallor, fatigue and lethargy, uh, seesaw breathing, like I mentioned, uh, and uh, unresponsiveness or limp muscle tone. <laughs> So immediate interventions in the pediatric patient who appear limp, lethargic, or cyanotic. Those are signs that this person is, is going into respiratory failure and we need to do something quickly. <laughs> uh, pediatric asthma patients may have a dry cough uh, and that indicates some inflammation in the lower airways. That dry cough, they, they really are having some uh, swelling down there. Um, but not necessarily having lots and lots of mucus. They have some small amounts of mucus that they're trying to remove, yet can't quite uh, get it out of there. So uh, oxygen administration is going to be one of the things that we need to hop on quickly. Uh, if possible, humidified oxygen. We don't always carry oxygen humidifiers, so it may not be possible. It's definitely not something we can do with our portable bottles. It could be something we can do with the wall oxygen uh, in the ambulance. <coughs> so for patients in respiratory failure, we need to establish an airway and assist ventilations, provide supplemental oxygen. This doesn't mean we go immediately for the most advanced airway we have. Remember that whole do two minutes of CPR before going to call for help? Well, sometimes that's all it takes is a minute or two worth of uh, resuscitation and they now start to bounce back. <clears throat> so slamming a king tube down them right away, uh, we could end up taking that out, which is going to potentially have some pretty negative side effects to go with it. <clears throat> um, supplemental oxygen and ventilation, of course. Uh, IV fluids can be beneficial with asthma patients to uh, either reverse or prevent dehydration. And you're going to need to follow protocols for that. Um, remember, the, the faster you're breathing, the more uh, moisture you're giving off. So uh, our typical dose of fluid for pediatric patients is 20 mils per kilo. <clears throat> and then be prepared to provide an airway and ventilate as necessary. Have your bag valve ready. If they look like they're headed down that road, be progressive and be proactive and, and get, the, uh, get the stuff ready to go. <clears throat> so in respiratory emergencies, um, there is a um, Haemophilus influenza B, or HIB, Hib uh, vaccination has basically all but eradicated epiglottitis in this age group. So epiglottitis is really falling out of, out of uh, um, its once, once uh, very popular status as being a child red childhood respiratory disease. Um, if epiglottitis is suspected, don't place anything in their mouth, don't agitate them and transport them uh, without delay. The uh, Haemophilus B <coughs> uh, is the critter that is uh, responsible for causing um, uh, the epiglottitis, the inflammation of the epiglottis, gives them uh, kind of a uh, uh, it, it's an acutely acute illness, so they go to bed feeling fine, wake up in the middle of the night, they're sick as heck, um, usually with a pretty significant fever, difficulty swallowing, which makes them drool a lot <clears throat> for the fact that anything that touches their epiglottis really irritates the heck out of it. Um, and then they'll have a difficulty with respirations, uh, strider, usually will also be tripod and drooling. Um, they may benef benefit from some bronchodilators, but really um, cool, moist air will probably be their, their biggest benefit. Um, try to be supportive. <clears throat>
Don't agitate the patient. <clears throat> Agitating the patient is going to just make them have more swelling. So um, request ALS if you've got a very long transport time, uh, just in case this kid needs to have a um, a cricothyrotomy done uh, and you know have a, a hole poked in their neck so they can breathe. <coughs> Laryngeotracheal bronchitis is the other name for it's the, common, the medical name for the common disease called croup. Uh, and croup is a viral infection, whereas uh, epiglottitis is a bacterial infection. Bacterial infections have higher temperatures, and and uh, uh, viral uh, uh, diseases have lower temperatures or low grade. Um, <clears throat> so. This viral infection of the lower airway, it worsens at night. Uh, a seal, it causes a seal bark style, style cough, very characteristic. Anybody who's known somebody with croup could identify that cough. Again, humidified oxygen is preferred um, to help uh, prevent from drying that out. Also, cool air, cool oxygen um, helps a lot. It really reduces the irritation and the swelling. Uh, so it, it can be hugely beneficial. Uh, people with croup, kids with croup, typically went to bed uh, after being sick for a day or two or three, kind of some general fluish-like symptoms, mild signs or symptoms uh, that have gone on for a day or two or three. Um, and then <clears throat> they get that seal bark cough. It's worse at night. Um, sometimes they'll have a little bit of strider to go along with it. And... Um, just be sure to assess for any uh, potential obstructions, but usually based off of history, we get the parents telling us, yes, they have uh, they have a, uh, a little lower grade temp, uh, been sick for a couple of days, and now all of a sudden we have this, this seal bark cough. And so um, in reality, uh, it, it's pretty easy to pinpoint. Whereas remember that the epiglottitis, they went to bed fine, they woke up in the middle of the night with a super high fever, and they're drooling, and um, it, it's a stark difference. Uh, although initially you might think, huh, uh, stop to think about what are the keys <coughs> between epiglottitis and croup. Um, croup patients may also benefit from some bronchodilators, so um, albuterol might be helpful. Even just um, doing some... Uh, Nebulized saline can even be helpful, just to uh, to help uh, moisture uh, create a little moisture and, and a, a cool mist uh, that the patient can breathe in. Uh, so, preferably, we don't have to do much as far as airway control. These kids tend to be a little bit more stable than the epiglottitis patients. So, <clears throat> very very common. Pertussis. Pertussis is the whooping cough, <clears throat> and its characteristic uh, is the whooping cough, or the whooping crane style cough. Um, it is a fairly serious disease, it can last for months, causes major, major coughing fits. Um, there are vaccinations for pertussis, the DTaP vaccination, which is diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Um, is not recommended until uh, there are two months of age. And there's usually a series of five vaccinations to confer immunity. So that's part of their whole childhood uh, immunization process. Uh, we do have occasional uh, flare-ups of pertussis uh, here in the Midwest. We tend to have um, some people who <coughs> have come to our country after not having um, the strongest healthcare system in their native countries, uh, and they tend to bring it with them. Um, so pertussis was once kind of looked at as, well, it's wiped, it's essentially eradicated. Um, not not true. Uh, so we see it come back. And then occasionally we have uh, adults that come down with it because they didn't get the full vaccination series as, as kids. <clears throat> Bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis is an acute uh, viral an illness of the lower airways typically affects kids two months to two years. 
It is characterized by airway constriction, expiratory wheezes, tachypnea, and signs of respiratory distress. The only thing that's probably really going to give you a lot of um, a clue, give you a clue that this is different from an asthma attack is most asthma patients are probably afebrile and have not been sick until they had their exposure, uh, whether that was or their, their aggravation, whether it was cold air or exercise or what have you. Um, whereas the bronchiolitis patient will have usually a fever and has probably been ill for a little while leading up to their attack. Um, it is most prevalent uh, between November and April, possible to be reinfected. Most common cause of bronchiolitis is the RSV virus, uh, which is the respiratory syncytial virus. <clears throat> Um, it's, it's a nasty virus. Um, it puts kids in the hospital. It will even at times fill up pediatric wards to the point in which patients are being routed to other hospitals because there are no more pediatric beds available. So there's our respiratory syncytial virus. <clears throat> One of the biggest concerns that goes with this in addition to the respiratory issues is dehydration uh, because they're breathing so fast they're giving off a lot of uh, of their their fluids a lot of their moisture for, uh, simply from breathing so something to definitely uh, keep in mind that this kid may benefit from uh, getting a little IV fluid or um, I, I don't know that this is somebody I would immediately slam an IO into um, it's usually not a critical situation that we have to be over the over the top concern um, with immediately getting access. So. But if you have a severe dehydration or somebody who has signs of shock, then of course it, it may be appropriate. <laughs> All right, except in newborns, cough and fever are common signs of pediatric pneumonia. Usually also complain of tachypnea or will also have signs of tachypnea, respiratory distress, lethargy, irritability, vomiting, um, and sometimes complaints of pain in the chest. Um, some kind of pleuritic style or rub style pain is pretty common uh, when it comes to uh, pneumonias. Uh, almost a pinpoint style pain or you know, a, a, a defined area of pain in the lung field. Uh, it's fairly common to go with pneumonia. So assisting ventilation if we have respiratory failure or rest, and for any of these respiratory emergencies, not just pneumonia or, or uh, RSV. You know, if, if they are going into respiratory failure or rest, definitely ventilate, ventilate, ventilate. CPAP, maybe. I think in the pre-hospital arena, there's still a lot of places that are very gun shy to pull the trigger and, and do CPAP on kids um, because it isn't without certain dangers. So <clears throat> the other maybe that goes with it is do we have the right size masks and the right size equipment to go along with it? Um, and, and that could be uh, one of the biggest hurdles uh, to doing CPAP in kids. Upper respiratory infections with rhinorrhea are very common. If you don't recall what rhinorrhea is, rhinorrhea is, rhea is the flowing, uh, and rhino is nose. So basically what I've been getting to deal with lately. Um, so for upper respiratory infection, uh, our common cold. So we have some uh, pharyngitis probably goes along with it, so a little sore, scratchy throat as well. Um, don't forget anaphylaxis is potentially going to show up as a respiratory emergency. Um, but remember that we typically also have the uh, history of an exposure and probably will also have some angioedema and some urticaria or hives to go along with it. <clears throat> so that anaphylaxis, dyspnea, wheezing, strider. 
So obviously a lot of these things look very similar. Um, they're going to sound a lot alike. That's why it is important to start to gather the details, to start to gather some of the information of the history instead of just pulling the trigger on something based off of a sign or symptom uh, that we start to put pieces together to determine the, the best route of action to take here. Um, whether we need to um, you know, do epinephrine, do we need to do a bronchodilator such as albuterol, um, fluids, no fluids, uh, do we need to start considering doing some advanced airway techniques. Uh, we, we have to look at the whole picture. <clears throat> so if we have respiratory emergencies, don't forget to ask about things such as allergies. There are the possibility of uh, exposure to allergens, and it doesn't have to be a direct. Those proteins just simply have to be in the air. Now that's why there's sometimes peanut-free zones and peanut-free tables in elementary school cafeterias. Uh, some elementary schools have gone as far as banning peanut butter because of the possibility of those proteins being in the air um, can potentially cause an, an anaphylactic reaction. Um, determine if the child has an epi auto injector and whether it's been used. Uh, remember, the pediatric version of the epi auto injector is 0 0.15 milligrams uh, compared to the adult version, which is 0 0.3 milligrams of epi. Cystic fibrosis. Now, we mentioned that one earlier. <clears throat> uh, so there's one. There's some defective genes, one inherited from each parent, and it results in extremely viscous, thick mucus. Uh, in the respiratory tract, it tends to obstruct airways and leads to life-threatening infections because it doesn't allow for things to get swept out and cleaned out as easily as they should be. Um, so this very heavy, thick mucus is really more of a, a trap. So do not withhold oxygen. Uh, IV fluids can be very helpful in, uh, in helping to hydrate the mucus. It's not something we're going to immediately see. Uh, results from. However, um, there is again some discussion on whether or not CPAP may or may not be appropriate. That's going to be again based off of your protocol. Um, and then nebulized uh, bronchodilators certainly can be of some benefit here. If we can make the, the bronchioles larger, uh, then more air can flow through them. All right, pediatric cardiovascular disorders. Cardiac arrest is usually due to hypoxia. I, I've mentioned it along, along the way. Pediatrics, kids have good hearts unless they have something weird and, and congenital. So cardiac arrest is usually due to hypoxia. And adolescents uh, have also been known to suffer cardiac arrest during strenuous activity. Um, oddly enough, uh, I had uh, two 14-year-old boys uh, different times, different locations, and whatnot, um, go into cardiac arrest while playing basketball. Uh, both of them died. Both of them had a, con a hidden congenital heart defect that uh, was unknown. Uh, it was kind of odd that, I mean, and this was a number of years apart even. <laughs> but the situations were, were almost eerie because they were so similar. Um, commotio cordis, if you remember from... Um, several weeks back, talking about commotio cordis. This happens to that direct blow to the chest at a, at a very vulnerable point in the cardiac cycle. So it falls where their, their heart gets depolarized at a point in which it's not supposed to be able to be depolarized uh, on a certain repolarization part of, uh, of the process. And for adolescents, early chest compressions with minimal interruption and rapid defibrillation. Again, we, we're concentrating really on on circulation, um, pushing the push the blood around. We'll get the air in there when we can, um, and then uh, we'll get the defibrillator going because uh, it's most likely something that uh, uh, is an electrical issue. <coughs> All right, and then Tox goes on to talk about congenital abnormalities. Uh, those uncorrected congenital defects can lead to poor perfusion and hypoxia, uh, really not terribly uncommon. And uh, sometimes 
people will make it into uh, middle, uh, almost middle adulthood before some of these problems are ever found uh, because they do a good job of being healthy and staying in shape. And it's not until things start to slow down a little bit that uh, some of those problems may start to, to crop up. So <clears throat> if the patient appears to be shocky, then treat him for shock. Um, remember, in our cardiac arrest situations, um, if the child is not yet reached uh, puberty or based off of your protocol, um, you are going to want to uh, uh, consider using a, a pediatric attenuator in your uh, defibrillator system. Um, it, it, it's too vague uh, to discuss really based off of not knowing what each person's uh, service uses for a machine. So knowing whether or not you use the the pediatric pads with the little teddy bear in there uh, on the connector, um, you're going to have to look at your own equipment and know who can we use these on, who can we not use them on. Um, the American Heart Association says if you don't have a pediatric attenuator, you don't have a pediatric set of pads, um, in a pinch you can use an adult set, just don't let them overlap. <coughs> All right, SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. <clears throat> sudden Infant Death Syndrome uh, it commonly occurs under um, one, well, obviously, occurs under one year of age. <clears throat> it cannot be explained um, despite an investigation and autopsy. And like I mentioned before, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. There's some commonalities that they see in SIDS cases, but um, there is no absolutes that they can ever find yet. Now, <clears throat> similar to SIDS uh, is the apparent life-threatening event, or the ALTI. Uh, the ALTI is a combination of apnea, color change, limpness, and a choking or gagging uh, uh, response. The ALTI uh, may or may not be a uh, a witnessed and interrupted and corrected SIDS event. So uh, kids need to be transported to the emergency department for evaluation. So um, infants with a reported ALTI need to go. So uh, if you get called to a, a, you know, a choking, a, a gagging, an apnea, uh, you know, a possible cardiac arrest, that kid has to go in. Um, they're going to be put on some monitors to make sure that they don't stop breathing and that they're not having heart arrhythmias and whatnot. Um, and they're going to try to detect those sorts of things. Um, if you put on some apnea monitors and so on, try to detect those sorts of things and uh, <clears throat> um, hopefully catch them before anything else happens to start appropriate treatment regimen. All right, there's a SIDS video to watch. All right. <clears throat> In the absence of signs or symptoms of, presu of presumptive death, so when we're talking signs or symptoms of presumptive death, we're talking things like uh, wrinkling of the cornea, um, the uh, <coughs> dependent lividity, rigor mortis, uh, lack of a, a pulse and respirations uh, by accurate uh, history of greater than 20 minutes, and we are going to we're going to begin CPR. Uh, we're going to transport continuing those resuscitative efforts. Uh, and all cases of sudden unexpected death will fall under the jurisdiction of a medical examiner and or coroner depending on the state um, <clears throat> and will have to be investigated. So document, document, document because your, your paperwork will be looked at. So uh, if the child is not a candidate for resuscitation, then treat the scene as a potential crime scene and remove yourself. If the child is stiff and the child has lividity, don't, um, don't disturb the scene as if you don't have to. If you know that this child is dead and as there's no chance of survival, um, then um, th there's no sense in messing up the scene. Let law enforcement then take over. <laughs> If law enforcement's not already on scene, of course, contact them. Uh, limit your uh, contact with the body and anything else on the scene. Uh, and then do not treat the parents as if they're at fault because 
in many cases this is a SID situation and uh, the parents have no control. The parents will be devastated. This is going to be uh, this is not going to be good for for anyone involved. So um, so be prepared. <clears throat> a few things to keep in mind when documenting a SIDS patient. In what position were they found? Uh, where was the child when the parents found them? What kind of surface? Was there any pillows, loose bedding, stuffed animals, other uh, potential asphyxiation hazards around? What kind of clothing was the child wearing? Could it have been an asphyxiation hazard? Could it have gotten caught on something? Uh, if the child was in a crib, were there signs of any defect of the crib? Uh, was there any opening in which the child could have become wedged? What's the general condition of the residence? Uh, who was present at the scene? What were their demeanors? Rigor or liver mortis? Skin temperature? And any apparent injuries or marks? Some of the commonalities that they've found, um, you know, they recommend that babies be placed on their back to, for sleeping. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they have the back to sleep campaign. Uh, they found commonalities that uh, babies placed on their bellies or on their sides could potentially um, have a, a higher risk of SIDS as as do kids with lots of fluffy stuff in their crib, including even the bumper pads around the sides of it. Um, kids that were in uh, particularly loose fitting uh, night clothing and houses of smokers, uh, the, some of the commonalities that they found between SIDS cases. <clears throat> do not misinterpret normal signs of death as signs of abuse. Remember, rigor mortis is, or I'm sorry, liver mortis, which is dependent lividity. Uh, is going to appear as bruising, basically. Uh, in case of pediatric resuscitation, if the parents can be uh, present, let them be. It, it will help them with their closure in the long run, if, if, should they come to that. <clears throat> Everybody's going to require emotional support after one of these cases. Probably going to be <coughs> CISD for you and your crews. Uh, the parents are most likely going to need some, some counseling as well, uh, at the very minimum, some clergy involvement. Um, and then recognize the signs of an acute stress reaction in yourself and others that responded and be prepared to seek assistance. Um, and these are probably one of the most common cases in which CISD or CISM team is called to perform a, a debriefing or stress management uh, seminar. <clears throat> Kids are also prone to certain infectious diseases, um, things such as meningitis. We've talked about meningitis um, in the past. <clears throat> in the adult population, kids are certainly uh, subject to uh, catching meningitis as well. So viral meningitis is, is the less severe. Uh, bacterial meningitis can be fatal. Uh, viral meningitis usually shows up as a uh, lower grade fever, a headache, photophobia, or um, light hurts their eyes, and a stiff neck. Bacterial meningitis is usually a high fever, seizures, and an altered mental status. Um, this is an inflammation of those layers around the brain and spinal cord. So the meninges, the dura mater, the pia mater, uh, and the uh, um, uh, arachnoid layer. So those are the where you see the swelling within those affecting the central nervous system. <clears throat> Meningococcal bacteria, which is the bacterial meningitis uh, cause, uh, enters the blood and then it can start to damage the blood vessels and that's when you start to see that purpura pop up. So you get bleeding in the organs and the skin. So remember purpura were the big, big uh, purple splotchy looking rashes, not the fine rash of a, of a petechial hemorrhage, but the big, uh, heavy, uh, thick uh, splotches. Fevers and chills, vomiting and diarrhea, joint, muscle pain, abdominal pain, chest pain, tachypnea, cold hands and feet. <clears throat> Once the meningitis has gotten into the blood, they develop meningococcemia, uh, and that certainly can be fatal. That's not a good thing. Neurologic diseases, such as 
seizures. <coughs> Probably the most common cause of childhood seizures is fever, or what we refer to as a febrile seizure. Um, very, very common, and uh, not uncommon for a kid to have a febrile seizure one time in their life and then never have another seizure again. The, the thing that I've associated with many febrile seizures um, is uh, the sudden change uh, in temperature. So the kid maybe did slowly uh, had a fever that went up and up and up and up. Parents got concerned. They ran some cold water in the bathtub, dunked the kid in the tub so they can drop that fever down, and it was too big of a shock to the system. So I can't count the number of, of wet kids uh, I picked up that had recently had a seizure uh, but had stopped before we got there because mom and dad decided they had to cool them off. <clears throat> Epilepsy, another common cause. Um, and then probably third on there is the drug slash toxins <coughs> or, you know, a poisoning essentially. May also see things such as metabolic disturbances such as hypoglycemia, trauma, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, tumors. Uh, these are all uh, becoming less likely. Um, febrile seizures are related to their fever, uh, either a quick increase or a quick decrease. Uh, they're generally very short in duration but, and will have a, a postictal state following. Um, do not bundle the, the febrile child up in blankets. You're just going to continue to, to uh, raise their fever, but also don't want to allow them to become chilled. So you have to keep your eyes on them to make sure that uh, they're, they're not getting too hot or too cold. Um, and AEIOU tips that we use in adults is also applicable for our pediatric population. So um, alcohol and anoxia, environment, epilepsy, insulin, uh, overdose, uremia, trauma, uh, infection, psychosis, poisoning, and stroke. All potential causes for alteration in mental status. Um, hydrocephalus. Uh, this is an imbalance between the formation and outflow or absorption of cerebral spinal fluid. Um, our body reabsorbs a certain amount of cerebral spinal fluid, so it kind of keeps a fine balance. Um, some, some people are unable to uh, appropriately reabsorb it uh, and, and get rid of the excess, but they continue to make more and more. It builds up more and more pressure, the incre increase in cranial pressure. Um, and usually ends up having some sort of a seizure or an alteration in mental status. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the special patient population. They'll often end up with a shunt place that will allow uh, some of that fluid to drain off. Um, <coughs> in the patient that still has an open fontanelle, you could see this as a bulging fontanelle. Once the fontanelles have closed, you'll see the signs of increased intracranial pressure. So headache, change in vision, cognitive uh, difficulties, uh, increase or decreased responsiveness, respiratory arrest. You might even see the Cushing's uh, triad. Uh, usually treated with a ventriculostomy shunt, which is basically a little drain that's placed in their brain and allows that excess fluid to drain off into their abdomen where it then is reabsorbed. Biggest problem with the shunts in kids is kids grow quick enough that they outgrow their shunt. So the tip of their shunt no longer dumps into where it needs to dump, um, and it actually gets pulled up and up and up. And so it's uh, it gets trapped, and then fluid gets trapped. It builds back up, and you know every couple, every so often, kid has to go in and have their their shunt revised so uh, they can uh, make sure and drain off the appropriate fluids. <coughs> Diabetes can be a problem in kids. Remember, typically, um, in, uh, juvenile onset diabetes or type 2 diabetes um, is, is the more common type in kids. It is the insulin-dependent version. So kids that are diabetics are almost always on insulin as opposed to uh, oral, oral antihypoglycemic, hyperglycemics. Um, <clears throat> they certainly have the same risks as, as adults do. Um, there's the potential for diabetic ketoacidosis or hypoglycemia. Um, they may also develop some cerebral edema. 
from poorly treated diabetes. Uh, many kids these days are being outfitted with insulin pumps uh, because the insulin pumps uh, can monitor blood sugars and adjust as necessary based off of that patient's blood sugar. So it gives them a, a much better uh, prognosis in the long run. Signs and symptoms basically remain the same. <clears throat> We're looking for alteration in mental status. If the patient has an altered mental status or history of diabetes, we should be checking a blood sugar. Um, <clears throat> they may have a persistent severe diaper rash from yeast organisms, uh, and that could be a sign of diabetes simply for the fact that um, uh, yeast thrives off of simple sugars. If they've got lots of extra sugars in their body, they're going to try to get rid of those via urination. So if there's a high sugar content in their urine and they have these diapers that stay on them for a couple hours at a time, um, the yeast will start to build up off of those sugars that are found in the uh, in the diapers and in the urine. So that's where these yeast infections can come from. <coughs> may also have signs or symptoms of lethargy or malaise, um, weight loss, thirst, frequent urination, um, often complain of being hungry. Remember to look for the signs or symptoms of the of the various uh, syndromes. So, um, the dehydrated patient with a ketony odor and Kussmaul, heavy, fast respirations, and vomiting, most likely has diabetic ketoacidosis. Whereas the hypoglycemic patient typically has a sudden onset change, either in the irritability or unresponsiveness, um, pale, cool skin usually will be also uh, clammy, uh, may have seizures. <clears throat> what are the signs or symptoms of dehydration in kids? Changes in, in bathroom habits such as fewer diapers, um, uh, frequent thirst or uh, not drinking a lot. Uh, the, uh, if they have a fontanelle, they would have a sunken fontanelle. Tachycardia, tachypnea. In the GI disorders, uh, we have the potential for gastroenteritis, which is very common. It's common in adults, common in kids. Um, the uh, gastroenteritis is usually an inflammation of some sort, usually an infectious process uh, of the uh, stomach and intestines. Uh, it can lead to uh, constipation, but more times than not is vomiting and diarrhea. Um, they may have poor skin turgor, few uh, diapers or uh, infrequent urination, no tears when they cry, sunken appearance to their eyes, dry mucous membranes, sunken anterior fontanelles, lethargy, tachycardia, tachycardia, pale, cool, clammy skin. So really those, same, those answer the same question that we had on the preceding slide, what is the signs of dehydration? Well, as we increase the motility of the gastrointestinal tract, more fluids are lost because there's not as much time for them to be reabsorbed from the intestines. <clears throat> EENT problems. Um, kids are very common to have a, a sty um, or a conjunctivitis, which is uh, the pink eye, <coughs> or a chalazia. Uh, remember, chalazion and styes are basically the same. It's just a matter if there's some granulated tissue there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, infections of the eye. They may have periorbital or orbital cellulitis, uh, which is kind of a big problem if they have a s uh, significant amount of swelling around the face and around particularly the eyes. There's a possibility there's an infection within the sinuses, which are very dangerously close to the brain. Uh, foreign bodies in eyes, ears, nose, mouth, um, you name it, they probably tried to put something in it, uh, particularly the earlier uh, on they are. Um, I, I've removed foreign bodies from noses and ears and mouths, and uh, yeah, sometimes it's pretty interesting things that they put in there. <clears throat> uh, various ear infections, otitis externa and otitis media, so common complaints of uh, ear infections. <clears throat> 
Uh, they may also have things such as uh, foreign bodies in their ears that have led to these uh, infections. Uh, epistaxis is pretty common. Usually the result of epistaxis is, uh, uh, or the epistaxis is a result of a, a digital trauma because kids are uh, like to pick their nose. Um, <clears throat> So, and it is usually an anterior site. It's usually a fairly easy epistaxis to, to fix because it's right up inside the mare uh, and we can pinch it off and usually get it to quit. Pharyngitis uh, from a variety of different uh, sources can be common. Um, so EENT issues are really treated the same as they are in adults. It's all really supportive care. <coughs> Behavioral emergencies. Um, while it's not as common in the younger kids, uh, it's probably becoming more common that um, younger kids are having uh, complaints of depression or mood disorders, um, occasionally even substance abuse and addiction. <clears throat> Depends on what the, the home life is a lot of times. Um, if they have access, easy access to substances, uh, it's, it's more common to see it. <clears throat> Eating disorders, uh, impulse control disorders, um, ADHDs and whatnot, those sorts of things uh, are, are probably a little more prevalent now than they used to be, but it may be just because they're diagnosed now as opposed to um, they weren't formally diagnosed before. <laughs> um, pediatric psychological emergencies, though, is, is huge, huge business. Um, there are two hospitals in the metro region, uh, or Omaha metro, that take care of pediatric psychiatric population. Um, and that's uh, Emanuel Hospital and uh, Mercy Hospital and Council Bluffs are the only two facilities that take uh, pediatric psych. <coughs> and they are routinely full. In fact, when it comes to pediatric psych beds, sometimes um, uh, p kids are actually shipped out of Omaha uh, to pediatric psychiatric facilities in Lincoln, uh, Des Moines, or uh, uh, even Kearney, Nebraska. So, the older the, the child gets, the greater chance that we're going to see things that are behavioral, such as depression and anxiety, or even uh, suicidal ideation. The suicidal ideation are, are those in which uh, somebody makes a gesture of some sort, uh, alluding to the possibility of suicide. <clears throat> um, your safety can be jeopardized by a child or, or an adolescent with a behavioral emergency just like it can with an adult. Um, sometimes kids have pulled some pretty pretty bizarre things. <coughs> Toxicology. Um, big one for kids, uh, mainly because they're, uh, the younger kids are very curious. The older kids are trying to do something they think is going to be cool. Um, <clears throat> it may be related somewhat to their underdeveloped sense of taste that some kids have or an inability to actually recognize the consequences of a behavior um, and, and so they may not put two and two together therefore um, sometimes their actions actually um, <clears throat> as unintentional as, as they were um, have extremely extremely poor uh, outcomes. Um, poor supervision or child proofing can also be other considerations. Um, any of us that have been parents any time recently have probably undergone the, the, the whole house child proofing situation. <clears throat> uh, drug and alcohol abuse even at the younger and young, younger ages. Um, kids smoking in middle school or even in uh, elementary schools these days and uh, even the potential for suicide attempts. Uh, that's mostly going to be in your adolescent age group. Your signs or symptoms are obviously going to depend on whatever substance they use. Um, very similar reactions to those that we talked about in our adult population when we talked toxicology and, and poisoning. <coughs> Remember, poisoning and overdose patients can deteriorate very quickly. The sad thing is, is we don't often have a lot of um, antidotes to use. So as we have patients that are uh, deteriorating quickly, we don't always have something we can actually really do anything about. Um, you know, of course, if we have something like an opioid, we can certainly give uh, a dose of Narcan, uh, 
you know, or if we have, uh, <clears throat> you know, carbon monoxide poisoning, we, we've got oxygen. But uh, remember, more times than not, there is not an antidote uh, as opposed to there being one of maybe a hundred real antidotes that are, are out there in the world. Um, <clears throat> you have to constantly be aware of their ABCs because they can very quickly uh, deteriorate. Um, we're not going to be giving activated charcoal, but if you would need to, it would be one gram per kilogram, minimum of 15 grams, follow your own protocol. Again, activated charcoal is being highly discouraged in the pre-hospital setting, um, in, in even sometimes in the, in the emergency room setting, it's discouraged. <coughs> Uh, coronary artery disease um, usually affects adults. Children are not at very high risk for that, simply for the fact that um, you know kids have not had the t enough time to uh, to damage themselves. And again, cardiac arrest is typically due to hypoxia. So adolescents known to suffer cardiac arrest during uh, strenuous activities, as well as commotio cordis. <coughs> And many times the patient is well conditioned with no known medical problems. So again, in many cases, we're really talking about a congenital issue as opposed to um, a, a truly, truly sick uh, heart from uh, long-term disease. <laughs> Sometimes the underlying problem is traced to a cardiac conduction abnormality, in which it is in many cases uh, with pediatric cardiac arrest. Sometimes it goes unknown. So maybe even a left ventricular hypertrophy. Kids can certainly have uh, problems with uh, blood pressure, such as uh, they may have a systemic hypertension that would lead to some uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, which is a overgrowth of the, the uh, tissues of the left ventricle of the heart. But kids also can get something called pulmonary hypertension. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is when the blood pressure between the heart and the lungs actually is very high. And um, in fact, the drug Viagra was originally invented for that. So um, I, I remember having a newer paramedic with me once going on a call, picked up a five-year-old girl who was on Viagra. Uh, I, I thought my, uh, my new brand new paramedic partner was, uh, was, was going to lose their mind going, what in the heck is a five-year-old girl doing on Viagra? Well, that was what it was originally made for. It just so happened that uh, it had a nice side effect, I guess, for 49% of the population or so. <coughs> uh, most of the larger schools these days have public access to fibrillators. And I know when, uh, when I was uh, working 911 in Iowa, that uh, I think all 3A and 4A high schools were required to have a defibrillator, and I think probably by now 2As and maybe even 1As are, are required to have them as well. So <clears throat> public access to fibrillation is becoming bigger and bigger. Um, uh, there's, there's more funding for it, and it's becoming a little bit more uh, accepted, I guess, in the, in the lay community as knowing that CPR isn't all that there is. Pediatric trauma <clears throat> and pediatric shock. Um, most common mechanism of injury for kids is blunt forces. Um, occasionally, there's all—I mean, there's always going to be uh, the weird things that happen in which somebody gets stabbed or shot. Uh, but in most cases, it's blunt force: hit by a car uh, while walking, hit on my bicycle, falls. <coughs> Uh, those be the common ones. Um, in motor vehicle collisions, a high index of suspicion for multiple injuries, including head and neck injuries. Remember, they don't have nice strong muscles to help. Uh, restrained pediatric occupants can suffer serious injuries from airbags uh, and, and seat belts. Remember, airbags are intended for adults. Um, airbags can sometimes be turned off depending on the type of vehicle. Usually we're talking a, a truck. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> improperly placed child seats uh, can have, uh, uh, when they come into contact with an, a deploying airbag, can have uh, brutal, brutal effects on the on the child. So, so the National Trauma Triage Protocol <coughs> for Pediatrics. <clears throat> 
Um, uh, this really hasn't changed really from adults. Um, there's a few maybe minor tweaks here when it comes to talking about things such as height. PCS less than 14, systolic pressure less than 90 respers. Um, <clears throat> outside of the 10 to 20 breaths per minute or less than 20 in an infant. Um, all penetrating trauma to head, neck, torso, and extremities proximal to the elbow and knees. Uh, flail segments, two or more long bone fractures, crushed, degloved, or mangled extremities. Amputation proximal to the wrist or the ankle. Pelvic fractures, open or depressed skull fractures, paralysis. Falls for adult greater than 20 feet or in children greater than 10 feet or two to three times the patient's own height. High risk auto crashes with intrusions greater than 12 inches into the occupant site or 18 inches at any site. Ejection of either partial or complete from the automobile. Death of the same passenger compartment. Vehicle telemetry data consists with high risk injury. So basically, um, you know, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck. Uh, auto versus pedestrian or cyclist thrown, run over uh, at 20 miles an hour or greater. <coughs> Motorcycle crashes at greater than 20 miles per hour. Um, risk of injury and, uh, from death increases after the age of 55, where children should be preferentially triaged to pediatric capable trauma centers. We'll take the, uh, the Omaha area, for example. Um, there are two pediatric trauma centers in Omaha. The level one trauma center is the Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, the level two pediatric trauma center is uh, Children's Hospital. Um, if it is a severe high level trauma, it goes to the med center first. Um, if it doesn't have, uh, if the patient is not really hemodynamically unstable and it's being more precaution, it really is uh, then routed to Children's. <laughs> Um, anybody with anticoagulation or bleeding disorders, this could include kids. Kids can have um, uh, hemophilia. Burns uh, without other trauma, we can triage to a burn facility or with trauma, goes to the trauma center. Um, time sensitive extremity injuries, so neurovascular compromise, end stage renal disease requiring dialysis, pregnancy after 20 weeks, or you just got a bad feeling about this. <clears throat> so injuries to the child struck by the vehicle depend on the v speed of the vehicle and the patient's height in relation to the vehicle. Um, you know, if we're talking a two-year-old hit by a car at 10 miles an hour, it's probably going to be pretty pretty radical. Uh, whereas if we're talking a 16-year-old hit at 10 miles an hour, they're going to flop over on, on the hood of the car, and it's not going to be as big of a deal. <clears throat> so high-speed impacts. Uh, with neck injuries, head injuries, multiple internal organs. Three most common causes of pediatric trauma death following injury are, include hypoxia, which that goes right back to what we learned about the medical side of things is hypoxia is the killer there as well. Uh, massive hemorrhage, because remember they have a much smaller blood volume, and traumatic brain injury. Well, their brain tends to be closer to uh, the ground and where all the action's going. So that makes sense that TBI would be a, a high killer. <coughs> the pediatric patient with suspected C-spine injury maintain the head in a neutral position and place a folded towel or blanket under the shoulders or use an appropriate pediatric immobilization device that has that built into it. <coughs> Child does not have a gag reflex, insert an oral airway. If you have an appropriate size king airway, you can consider that as well. <clears throat> Pre-hospital endotracheal innovation in pediatric patients is associated with worth, worse outcomes. This really applies to paramedics. I don't know why they have it really in there for AEMTs, but um, there's often times in which kids don't get intubated, and that's fine. Um, we, we, we make do with what we've got, and uh, you know, if what we're doing works, we don't always have to go to the top. <coughs> Oftentimes, victims with TBI, shock, and chest trauma will need assisted ventilations. Use of supplemental oxygen is going to be adjusted to the rate and depth according to the patient's size. 
And hyperventilation is a com common mistake in trauma patients. It can worsen uh, cerebral edema and impair uh, cardiac output. <clears throat> so hyperventilation, um, as much as we used to really, really rely on it, even even now, sometimes they're they're even discussing whether or not hyperventilation uh, is is appropriate for um, adult trauma victims. You know, so they really, really are kind of discouraging it um, <clears throat> because they uh, um, are are not even really seeing great benefits with the adult patient who receives hyperventilation. So. Continue to control external hemorrhage. Be suspicious of internal hemorrhage. Keep the patient warm. We can use tourniquets on little kids too. Um, monitor their mental status, vital signs, signs of shock. <coughs> Particular bradycardias and tachycardias uh, make us very concerned that the patient is becoming shocky. Cap refill is a pretty reliable sign of perfusion in the pediatric population. They haven't uh, polluted their veins to the point in which um, uh, it becomes uh, you know, poor circulation due to uh, eating too many cheeseburgers. So cap refill works pretty well for them. <clears throat> but if you can get a blood pressure, do. So they're showing uh, the spinal mobilization of a pediatric patient here. Uh, on a specialty pediatric board, uh, I know uh, at least in Council Bluffs and and uh, and probably some of our other sites, um, be able to uh, to put these to use and, and practice with these a little bit uh, during skills days. <coughs> They're a very nice item to have uh, available to immobilize kids uh, because kids don't. Uh, it's not one size fits all. It, uh, I once responded to a hospital to do an interfacility transport to the trauma center of a two-year-old who had fallen out of a second-story window, and they had this little two-year-old in the middle of a full-size backboard with blankets and towels and all sorts of stuff all just kind of jammed up around this kid, and they expected me to transport the kid this way. I mean, the straps weren't even on, and uh, and I told them no, and I went and, and uh, actually. Uh, we had already used our pediatric spine board for the day, <clears throat> and so uh, and hadn't gotten another one, and so we uh, we went out and got the KED out of the uh, the truck, and uh, and papoose the kid up in the KED, and and uh, it worked very 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 wonderful. Uh, that's what we used to use before we had pediatric uh, long spine boards for the you know two three year old age group four year olds maybe uh, was the KED. So it uh, and it worked very nicely. So, So a car seat can be used to assist in manual stabilization of the spine during extrication. And then the preference is that the child be removed from the car seat uh, um, and then placed in an immobilization device. So <clears throat> you can use it to get them out of the car. They highly discourage uh, us transporting them in the car seat anymore. <clears throat> car seats are good for one crash. Uh, just like motorcycle and bicycle helmets are good for one crash, uh, and then they are supposed to be destroyed and no longer used. Um, the inst possible instability of the car seat makes it unreliable for use as an immobilization device. So as we're patting our child uh, and immobilizing them, make sure that we're patting them to the shoulder and make sure we maintain a proper cervical alignment. Uh, and that child's uh, smaller size may need increased padding along the sides. So uh, if we were to decide to put them on a full-size adult backboard, we may have to get a little creative in how we package them on there. <clears throat> so the rule of nines as it applies to the younger, younger uh, generations, <clears throat> remember in the, in the peds, uh, we take a little away from the arms and the legs and give it to the head. So um, in the child, <coughs> um, we've got four and a half front, four and a half back, four and a half front, four and a half back, um, and then seven and seven front and back for the legs. <coughs> 
Uh, so giving us 14. <clears throat> and then that extra amount is given to the head, making it 18. All right, children have very thin skin, so a lower temperature and a shorter duration can potentially cause some pretty severe burns. Um, and then there are tons and tons of accidental childhood burns every year that can be prevented. That's where part of getting into the public health system and being proactive <coughs> is so critical for EMS. Uh, one in five burns in the child uh, result in, uh, is a result of a child abuse or neglect. So burn patterns should increase your suspicion. Drowning. <clears throat> Drowning is a primary respiratory impairment uh, resulting in submersion in a liquid medium. It's higher in toddlers uh, and in adolescent males because adolescent males are doing stupid things. Toddlers just don't know better. Uh, remember, uh, just a little bit of water in the bottom of a bucket uh, can be fatal for a toddler. Uh, they tip over, they get their head down in the water, um, and uh, because they're so top-heavy, they can't get out of that bucket. So toddlers and uh, small children typically are drowning in bathtubs and potentially swimming pools. Uh, adolescents uh, probably uh, in uh, natural bodies of water more commonly. Uh, the risk-taking behavior in alcohol uh, in the adolescents also raise the risk. So. Really, after they've gotten out of childhood, drowning most of the time involves some sort of a substance. <coughs> and the act of drowning is actual asphyxia uh, or near asphyxia as a result of hypoxia and acidosis. So um, don't forget that potentially there's going to be uh, the chance of spinal trauma. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, that is something that we may have to uh, uh, be immobilizing. <clears throat> so most children who survive drowning are rescued within two minutes of submersion. And death occurs due to asphyxia and cardiac arrest, potentially from ARDS in the long term, uh, ARDS or multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Um, I, I know of a case in which a, a kid uh, drowned warm water, fresh water drowning uh, in, a, in a lake during dirty water. Uh, the kid was submerged for quite some time and, and uh, resided in the hospital, I want to say, for three or four years um, in a vegetative state before he finally caught a pneumonia and died. So uh, it was a real sad situation that uh, you know, the timing was just off. It needed to be either just a little sooner or a little later. And, and it wouldn't have been such a sad story. But <clears throat> so if the patient's still in the water, uh, perform a rescue if you're trained to. Otherwise, await uh, trained water rescue personnel. <coughs> Remove them from the water as quickly as possible. Potentially, if you have the, the materials to do a spinal immobilization right then and there, um, then uh, perform your spinal immobilization. Um, if they're unresponsive, start compressions and ventilations. Then tr all patients who have been submerged need to be transported. There is a problem called secondary drowning syndrome in which the water, uh, the edema starts to form in their lungs is delayed after they've actually come back out of the water. <clears throat> so for patients in cardiac arrest, uh, chest compressions, airway management, make sure and dry the patient before using any defibrillation. And then consider the, the, uh, the potential for hypothermia in the drowning patient. <coughs> Remember, they're not dead till they're warm and dead. Child abuse. Um, this is a, an example of, of a stocking burn foot. Uh, it's not a very good example. You can't see from the sides. But typically, this would have a burn uh, pattern that would be just like having little booties on. Um, and uh, burns to the bottoms of both feet. That's just not common to see. Uh, and pretty good burn there. So. so child abuse is the improper, intentional, and excessive actions that cause injury or harm to a child. Child neglect is inadequate perfusion, or perfusion, sorry, inadequate provision uh, uh, of attention or respect to a person that is entitled to it. So that can be things such as safe place to live, food to eat, and health care. 
So in Iowa, you are a mandatory reporter. You have 24 hours to, to uh, issue a formal uh, report and 48 hours to issue a written report. Uh, in many cases, law enforcement's already involved, so the reporting is kind of taken care of immediately. Regardless, you are ethically obligated to report your suspicions. Remember, that's all it is, is you're reporting suspicions. You are not the one that has to prove this. You're just reporting what you observed and what you felt about the situation. It is up to professional investigators to actually prove it. Um, and sometimes it's very hard to prove. It's very frustrating for people who report these things sometimes because they know what's going on. The reporter or the, uh, the investigator knows what's going on. There's just not enough evidence um, to actually pin a charge on it. Um, <clears throat> our first priorities are make sure the scene is safe, that our cells are safe, and that the child is cared for and to try to get that child out of the environment. So we need to do what we can to say, oh yes, this child needs to have an evaluation in the emergency department and transport that child. Uh, we'll let law enforcement take care of the rest document the crap out of that thing. So document objectively, don't make assumptions or draw conclusions. For example, you could document that the patient uh, stated he was struck with a belt buckle uh, or that the patient has a two inch by three inch U-shaped bruise on his back, but you cannot state in your opinion that the patient was beaten with a belt buckle. I mean, be, be objective. We're not trying to draw any conclusions. We're just trying to factually document. Um, objectively document and per, uh, precisely describe uh, all injuries uh, by their appearance and location. If necessary, make drawings, take photos, uh, if that's in your protocol. <coughs> uh, place in quotation marks any relevant statements made by witnesses, patients, or caregivers. Document the conditions and surroundings. Document the relevant aspects of the child's appearance, uh, uh, such as what he's wearing, if he's found outside in cold weather with no coat, uh, was unkempt, or appears thin and emaciated. Uh, and then document the behavior of the child and the caregivers. All right. In summary, <clears throat> pediatric patients are not only smaller, but have anatomic and physiologic socio so psychosocial differences. You must consider uh, in, in the assessment and management of these emergencies. The epidemiology and the injury and illnesses are different in various pediatric groups. In many cases, it is the same as that of adults. Key to successfully managing a pediatric call is to have knowledge of those differences, equipment uh, to accommodate them, and the ability to maintain your composure. <coughs> Key differences. Uh, that we talk about in the pediatric population include airway uh, and airway management techniques, uh, increased susceptibility to hypothermia and dehydration, and subtle signs and symptoms of shock despite significant blood loss. Children may be more vulnerable to the effects of certain infectious illnesses and that can certainly lead to airway obstructions, respiratory distress, respiratory failure, or respiratory arrest. And hypoxia is one of the leading causes of cardiac arrest in pediatric patients. SIDS and ALTI affects the infant age group, and related signs that can mimic in, uh, indications of possible child abuse. Document the scene very carefully as a potential crime scene without implying any fault. Recognize, document, and report suspected abuse and neglect. Pediatric trauma patients may have different patterns of trauma than those of adults, uh, even though it's the same mechanism, and this is in, in part to their anatomical differences. Blunt mechanisms are most common in the pediatric population, and they're more likely to produce a multi-systems trauma because it's over a smaller area. Whenever possible, transport critically ill or injured pediatric patients to facilities capable of spe specialized pediatric care.